Good evening. Uh, good morning. And uh, sorry for the short notice. Okay. We'll start off with our, the first question on the sheet, which is about the mezuzahs in 770. I'll tell you how this came about. We were sitting and learning a mimer yesterday, yesterday morning, and we're talking about the, it says in Poskim that when you sit in the sukkah, you have to have kavona. You have to have, uh, you, you have to think about the fact that Yidin, they wish to took out the Yidin in the desert and they were protected with the Anani HaKovet. Now the kavona is part of the mitzvah. So Rabbi Wilhelm, who was teaching the Maimo, said that, because really how are you fulfilling the mitzvah of sukkah? You're sitting in it, but you're, you're passive. What, what are you doing? So he wanted to suggest that the kavona is, is the way you do Bimakayim the mitzvah, by having that kavona. Okay, fine. So the conversation went on. He suggested also that the mitzvah of mezuzah, you have a mezuzah. How do you fulfill the mitzvah of mezuzah? So he suggested that the by the fact that you touch the mezuzah, because once you put up mezuzah, it's passive. It's just there. So he was suggesting by the fact that you touch the mezuzah, it's as if you're doing the mezuzah, so to speak. Because we know that if, for example, you put on tzitzis, a talus, early on, uh, or in, in, in before day, daybreak, or let's say you put on your, your tzitzis um, when you couldn't make a bracha. So then the halacha is that when you can make a bracha, you're mamashmish, you touch the tzitzis, and then you can make a bracha. And for that matter, the tefillin. If you didn't make a bracha when you put on the tefillin for whatever reason, so then you are mamashmish, you touch the tefillin, and it's counted as if you've put on the tefillin now, so to speak. So he was suggesting that the touching of the mezuzah, he said he, he read it somewhere, which I, I, I haven't found the source yet for this, but the touching of the mezuzah, which is mentioned in Shefun Aruch, he doesn't talk about kissing the mezuzah. There are more talks about touching the mezuzah. So he was suggesting that the touching of the mezuzah is a form of a pu'ula, of an, a deed that you're doing the mitzvah. All right. So Taking that a little bit further, here's um, something very interesting, that the idea of putting a mezuzah inside a, a bamboo or something is mentioned in Poskim, might even be mentioned in the Zoya, I'm not sure, the idea of having it inside a, a kind of a, a pipe, but in 770, <coughs> particularly in the Rebbe's room, you'll see that the mezuzahs are in plastic or paper covers. And what I'm suggesting is that if it would be a rigid mezuzah case, then when you touch it, you're not touching the mezuzah. And there is something about touching the mezuzah. There should be like a feeling, a, sen a, sen a, sen a sense that you're touching the mezuzah. So Dafka, by having a soft cover to the mezuzah, of course, there's the other side of it, that, that when it's a soft cover, the mezuzah is not so protected from being squashed, etc. But on the other hand, there seems to be something about feeling the mezuzah when you touch it. And if that's the idea of like mamashmish, but tzitzis, mamashmish, but fillin, that might explain also why there is dafka a mile in, in having a, a, uh, an, a soft cover for the mezuzah rather than a rigid uh, soft um, hard cover. Let's move on. So the second question is, someone asked me earlier this week or last week, now we've got two weeks of, Shio, of, of Shilas here. For some reason, last Thursday night, we didn't do a Shia. So, um, so um, the question was, does one need to use Lecha Mishnah for each meal on Yom Tov? And the question is a practical one. You make a Fabrengin at the end of Yom Tov, whether it is um, Mashiach Suda or the end of Shavuos, end of Yosh Hashanah, the end of Simchas uh, Teira, does is there a requirement of Lechem Mishneh at that point? That's that is the question. Okay, so now let's take a look at our our list of uh, yeah, our print, our uh, display. So first of all. 
is there a need for Lecha Mishnah on Yom Tov? So, because the Lecha Mishnah is the Zecher for the fact that they didn't have Mon. So here, this is from the Rif, in the end of Psochim. So he writes, Omer of Abba, Chai Vodom, you meant to be by Tseyach, Shtei Kikris, Shleimus, on Shabbos, you should be breaking bread on two loaves, and because it, it says Lokto Lecha Mishnah, now the riff adds that he's quoting from Seder of Amram Goren, that also Yom Tovim Nami, also on Yom Tov you need to break bread on two loaves, because the idea of Shabbos is because there was no mon which came down on, 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 on Shabbos. They, they kind of had a double pair of double uh, measure on Arab Shabbos. But Yom Tovim Nami Lehavanochis. Actually, on Yom Tov also, the mon did not come down. It would come out of Yom to a double measure. Just like you'd have a double measure on Erev Shabbos, so too there would be a double measure on Erev Yom Tiv, And that's the basis of having, that's the last two lines, should have two whole loaves for Lecha Mishneh, just like for Pesach, for Shabbos. Then he goes on to Pesach, which is another parasha, three matzahs, two matzahs, etc. So that's the, that's the Shukhanar, that's, that's the Rif. Then we have here on the top of your, your screen, you see here from the Shulchan Aruch, Hichas Yom Tov. Now I've, I've brought this from the Shulchan Aruch because the Alter Rebbe somehow does not have this, you know, he has this simon, but this emphasis is not there in the Alter Rebbe. V'chayiv levtsoya al shtei kikrois v'lekvoya al kol sudal ayayin that every meal of, of Yom Tov should have two loaves. Well, meanwhile, he said the meals of Yom, should, Yom Tov should have two loaves. So he's bringing down what the Berif has paskind, that Yom is not Mufurish in Gemara, but this is how we learn, that Yom Tov also you have to have Lechem Mishneh. Question is, do you need to have, first of all, a Shalosh Shudas? People ask this question. Does, is there a requirement of Lechem Mishneh by Shalosh Shudas? So now this is now from the Alter Rebbe's Shukhan Aruch. This is Reis Tzadik Aleph, where he says, that Bashala Shudas, you should also make moitzi on two loaves, just like for the first two meals. And if you'd have several meals over Shabbos, more than three, also you should have Lechem Mishneh at each meal on Shabbos. First opinion. But yes, Oimrim, there are those who disagree and they say no, that Sudas Lishis, you can manage with one chala. You don't have to have two. Why is that? Because on Friday came down the moon, which had two measures for each person. And for each measure, each oimer, <clears throat> they were able to produce two loaves. So that means the Friday delivery produced four loaves. One of them was eaten on Friday. And then they had Friday night. And then they had one on Shabbos morning. So now you were started off with four, and now you're left with one. Therefore, for Sudash Lishis, you don't need to have two loaves. You only have to have one. So this is, again, the first opinion says, Shada Shudas, you should have uh, two loaves, because the idea of Lechem Mishnah should be celebrated in, at every meal. The second opinion says, no, the Shada Shudas, you don't need to have a, a, two chalas. Indeed, the Minhig has been to take the lenient view that by Shada Shudas, to rely on having one loaf. He says, really, the main halach is like the first ap approach, and you should have Lecha Mishneh by Shalash Shudas also, unless you don't have, okay, then you shouldn't have less than one. Okay, fine. All right, so so Shalash Shudas and Shabbos, it's recommended to have, to have uh, Lecha Mishneh. And what we're saying here is similarly, now, so now let's come back now, on Yom Tov. There's no chiyuv of a suda shlishis on Yom Tov. But the question then is, it's it's totally voluntary. Is there in a, a, a uh, Indian of having Lecha Mishneh? So now, looking, this is now from the Shemir Shabbos Kilchoso. So he writes, Mitzvah lev tzoya, v'chol suda shal Shabbos v'shel Yom Tov, al shnei luchomim shleim. Just the same logic that there is to have two loaves for every meal on Shabbos, the same logic applies to Yom Tov. And then he says, uh, later in the notes, whatever he says, it's, it's of course, you can manage with one, but really, one should we do? 
when I actually, at the beginning of the week or last week, when the person asked me this question, I hadn't done my homework. This is the, the shear drives me to do a bit more homework. But meanwhile, I told him, I, we all remember very vividly by the Rebbe, but it was the Suda at the end of Yom Tov, and uh, with Rosh Hashanah or, uh, yeah, and the Rebbe would hold these two big chalas, the two round chalas, and he would hold them, they were facing back to back, and he would make a moitzi, he would get cut, the, I remember holding the two chalas, like this, back to back, and with a knife, like a swinging motion over the two chalas, and then he made a moitzi on, on one of the, you know, he broke off uh, a piece of chala from one of the chalas, so he was moitzia, well, that was obviously the uh, the third Suda for Yom Tov, and still he went made on, on Lecha Mishnah, so it's uh, recommended, so this is back to the question, you're making a Fabrengin for the end of Yom Tov, should you encourage Lecha Mishnah? You should, yeah? It's not a big deal, because unless you're very, very worried about COVID, you can have to, one person touch it, takes it, the other one's chala, puts it together, and you can you can manage to have Lecha Mishnah. Okay, so that's the question two we've dealt with, Let's go on to the question three. This was, um, I think it was Shabbos Shuva. It was recently one of the neighbors knocked on. So what's a Shabbos? So it's an hour after Shabbos. And he said, for some reason, that at Havdola, they had made the bracha, ham, the person made Havdola, said the Hamavdil, had forgotten to say Baya Priyagofen. And then he said, Baya Priyagofen after Hamavdil. So does he have to repeat Havdola or Wayu Yoitsa? So here's actually quite an interesting, uh, an interesting Chiddush here, that the Alter Rebbe, now we have the Alter Rebbe at the top of your page is in Hilchus Pesach, where we have the Seder, he talks about the Seder of Yachna Haz, by Kiddush, when you say first the word Pepri Agofen, and then you say the Brocha Makadish. Israel Vazmanim, then the Brocha on the, on the flame, then Beimara Eish, and then you make the Brocha Hamargal bin Kodesh Lakodesh, and then Shechionu. So we know the Yakna has. Then the Alter Rebbe adds in brackets. Now, what is a, a, um, a style of the Alter Rebbe with the brackets? There is a story that the Alter Rebbe wrote things in brackets. He wanted to re review them at a later stage. That, may, that is also true, but it seems to be also when the Alter Rebbe came up with his own Chiddush. So he would often put those chidushim in a bracket. So if he switched the seder of the yak nahaz, it's yotze yoyotze. You don't have to do a kiddush again. Unless hikdim hakiddush lebirchas ayin. If you made first mekadish yisrael vazmanim and then hagofen, then he says you have to make kiddush all over again. Because this is a machlokes b'shamer b'shil, b'shamer say you have to first say the bracha mekadesh hashabos and then hagofen, because it's the kiddush which kind of invited the, the reason why you have the wine is because of the kiddush, the first of the kiddush, and b'shil will say no, you have to first make the bracha on the wine and then you make the bracha mekadesh hashabos. Now, if you follow b'shamer against b'shil, you don't yotze. Says the Alter Rebbe, if a person made, made Kiddush, and he first said, HaMekadosh HaShav, or HaMekadosh Yitzrol Vazmanim, and then said, Be'i Priyagofen, he has to do Kiddush again. So then, this is, that, that was like raised an alarm bell in my mind, that this boy who came around to the, to the door, Moshe Shabbos, two weeks ago, actually not Yosef, the same thing, that you meant to make first HaGofen, and then the Baruch HaMavdil. And that's what my mind is. Is there a difference between Havdola and Kiddush? Al Trebbe's Kiddush is about, about, uh, is about Kiddush, not about Havdola. With Sham, I talk about Kiddush. I don't talk about Havdola. So I was, I was mulling about this. And I felt that I told him not to make Havdola again. Afterwards, I looked into it a bit further. One of the prominent Goinim in Poland, going back about 100 years ago, his name was Reb Meir Arik. And it's a chosid, I don't know of which Rebbe, Sechstark in Alter Rebbe. And Reb Meir Arik, in his notes in the Sefer Minchas Pitim, he asks a question How can the Alter Rebbe say that you first make Mekadesh Shabbos and then 
Um, and you not yotze. Take a look in the in Shukhan Aruch, in Hechaz Kiddush, which you have the bottom of your page. It says, Kiddush ala kois. If you made Kiddush on a cup of wine, normal Kiddush. And then, by mistake, you slipped up and you start talking about unrelated topics. Hifzik Bedibur, you start talking about uh, who won, Chelsea or Arsenal? You know, start talking about Jimmy Greaves, all of us held him. So now, so Hifzik Bedibur, you have to make it Hagofen again. And you don't have to make Kiddush again. Ah, so he's made Kiddush, Hagofen, and then he made the Hamakadish Shabbos. But then he said Hagofen afterwards. So he's doing like Mishamai. So how is the Yotzer? So the Rebbe Arik asks this question How can the Alter Rebbe say if you switch the order, you're not Yotzer? Here you see that you are Yotzer. That's the Rebbe Arik's question. And the simple answer is, which later I think the Tila Ludovic, oh, I don't remember exactly who, others respond to that question. Um, the, the, the following. When, when the Alter Rebbe says, you're not Yoitze, means, if a fellow wants to be an Oibachachem, I don't know how you say Oibachachem in English, a fellow wants to be a smart aleck, and he says, I'm going to do Kiddush, and then, then Hagofen. So any other tricks which you'll do, you're Yoitze B'dayavid. But you want to be, this trick, you're doing consciously, in the wrong order, you're doing that with you're not Yoitze. The Alter Rebbe, where he talks about the fellow for God, it wasn't, he's trying to do it. I mean, Bishami, he doesn't even know about Bishami. He, he, he slipped up. He spoke about the Jimmy Greaves. It was Wilson. He's not talking about, thinking about Bishami. Good. So then he is Yetzir. And so coming back to our story, the fellow who made half dollar and slipped up, he's not thinking about Bishami. He made a mistake. He's just a little bit confused. And he made a mistake. He's not trying to follow Bishami. There, the Alter Rebbe wasn't talking about this. When the Alter Rebbe says, Mshino Hasedim, means he consciously made a change. Then we say, you're passing it wrong, you have to do it again. In the case of uh, a person who slipped up, made a mistake, then you don't have to repeat the Kiddush, don't have to repeat Havdol. Let me now look at um, one of the notes. Where, where, do you, where you need, where you do need two Chalas, but forgot. Can you use a frozen Chala for the second one? And the answer is yes. It doesn't take long for them to defrost, and you're not mechuyev to eat both. Um, so yes, you can you can use a frozen chala. There is an interesting question whether you can use an erev pesach shachal be as a shabbos. Whether you have to use a matzah wrapped in a plastic bag together with a chala. I mean, I wouldn't dream of doing that, but uh, the question has been addressed. All right, let's move on. Another question which came through this week. Someone asks. Uh, oops, I'm sorry. I. Uh, I tried to cover the number of the uh, of the door and the artwork moved over. Doesn't matter. There's a house and they've got this overhang, as you can see. And as you look towards the bottom uh, next to the stairs, there are some plant pots. And the question was, would they be allowed to consider under the overhang to be considered um, a Rishus HaYochid to be able to take a key hidden under the plant pot and use it to open the door. As you can see, the, the front wall of this property is quite low, so it doesn't make it, it's not 10 to high. So then there, were, there was Svara was, the question was, could we take that overhang and consider that as a, a wall? Now we have the term which we have for this is P Tikro Yorid Vesosin that the edge of the, of the ceiling kind of creates a, a vertical, you've got a horizontal ceiling, and the edge of that horizontal uh, ceiling will be considered to be creating a vertical barrier. So the idea was that as if you're going to have a vertical barrier coming down along the length of this, um, this overhang and also over here, um, the, the width, and that would create that that plant pot would be inside the Rishus HaYochid and you'd be allowed to carry from one to the other. So now here we have, this is from the Alter Rebbe's Shukhan Aruch, in the Dinim of Eruv, etc. Um, Shin Samach Aleph. And he talks here about a, a, a breach in, in, in a corner of a property. 
And then he says, what about a house, which there's a, a breach at the corner, there's the wall that has come down at the corner, and there's a, there's a diagonal opening to this house. So he says, you won't, you won't use, oz ein oimrim, you don't use the principle of pitikar yoyri And he adds another explanation, which was, was news to me, actually. The, the logic of pitikar yoyri v'soysum is mishum shedoyme lepesach. When you've got three sides, we've got three sides, and the fourth side, there's the end of a ceiling. And so we're going to look at it as if it was a doorway, and there's a door. The Karen Zovis, and this is a kind of principle in Halocha, it's not derech to make a, a, a Pesach to a property in the corner. Meanwhile, what he's saying is that Pitikra can only be in the middle of the wall, but not at a corner. Um, Avol Pesach Shein the Karen Zovis, if it be just a single um, break, break, you could use the, the principle of Pitikra, the edge of the ceiling would be creating a barrier. The second opinion says, Yes, Oimrim, and even if it's two of them, um, you could do your PT and you if you've got two walls together as an L, which are there, and then you've got another two walls which are missing, and there's a ceiling over there, you would be able to, in the second opinion, you could do PT but not when you've got two parallel walls, like a you know, like a carport idea. So then we've got these two opinions, and a, the conclusion is that actually that you could do Pitikriyod Vesosum as in, in our instance. However, he finishes off that's the last line, it's better to take heed of the first opinion that you can't do Pitikriyod Vesosum. So coming back to our our overhang or awning, whatever you want to call it, can you can you use the principle of pitik of If it's diagonal, if it's slanting, for sure you cannot. That's discussed earlier or later in the same simon. If it's flat, so the ikir hadin it you can do, but it's recommended not to rely on that. Now let's finish off then. What I did say to the questioner is if you hide your key, under something which isn't muksa, a plant pot may very well be muksa. If you hide your key, you are able to move it within Daladamas in the front garden and then bring it to the door, push the door, push, oh, it's an important point here. Many people have doors which open onto a place where there's no area, like in a block of flats, let's say, or a door, like say on the side of, of a uh, shop, which is open a mamish onto the street. You, you, you just you're outside the door, you're in the street. You cannot put the key in and push the door in, because then you will have you taken the key from the street and put it into the Rishasayachit. So if you have such a door, which is mamish onto the street, so the, the, the way to do it is you put the key in and you push the door just an inch, two inches, just beyond the door jam. You withdraw the key and put it back on yourself or where you're hiding it, and then you go in. But you don't push the door in all the way in with the key in it, because effectively you've been taking the key from Rishus Harabim or into the Rishus Hayach. Let's move on. Okay, so here I was asked the following question, going back a little bit before Rosh Hashanah, and the fellow is Chsida uh, Shingeman, and he is the Baltikeya, and so he's pastor. Baltikeya should be, uh, it says he should be the, 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 the most tzaddik uh, person seen as a tzaddik in, the, in that environment. Um, all right, so he's a chsidish in Geman. It turns out that uh, he davens slower. And so there's the Gabe who will bang on the, on the bimmer or whatever to announce, because we blow show from the quiet Shmon Esra. The Gabba will bang on the table, and he has to blow, but he's not up to that. So can he blow Shoifer in the quiet Shemun Esre when he's not up to that? So it's interesting, which I didn't, I wasn't aware. As you know, there's this difference between Ashkenaz and, and, and Svard. It's more a, a Minak Svard uh, to, to, to blow in the quiet Shemun Esre. So um, in this Matiya Frayim, that's the lower quote, 
He says, generally the Ashkenaz meaning is not to blow in the quiet Shemones. Then he says, third line here, yeah? oh, second line. So it's news to me. He's, he's suggesting that it's actually the Chazan who blows the shofar in the quiet Shemones, which is not the experience I've had. Uh, you know, being, being around, it was in some 70 also, it wasn't the Chazan who blew in the quiet Shemonestra. So if it would be the Chazan blowing in the quiet Shemonestra, we wouldn't have this question because he's, he's, he's got his, he's running the show. But the, the meaning of which in Chabad is that you have a Baltakeya and you have a Chazan and, and, and a Gabe. And so uh, the Gabe will bang on the table. So now the Alter Rebbe in Shulchan Aruch talks about the blowing in the um, shofar during Shemun Esra. And it says about the chazan, whether he can blow the Shemun Esra. He says, really, he shouldn't be blowing because it's confusing. Here is true because uh, he might be able to, not be able to retrace where he's holding in Davenig. Then third line over here on the top of the page, Avalim who moved to Rabbi if the chazan feels confident that he will be able to resume the Davenig without being too confused, or He's davening from a siddur. Shibavade who moved to yeah. So um, you have it very easy. We all have siddur in Baruch Hashem. Those days, uh, the chazan knew it balpe. Yucha litkoya afim yesh odom acher she yodel litkoya kamoisu. If the chazan is confident, he'll be able to resume the davening after blowing shofar in the shemnesra. Is allowed to, and he explains the fishihat kio eino hef se klal bitzfilo. Tkia, blowing shoif is not a hefsik at all. The way I understand it is, it's not speaking. It's not as if you're talking about any other topic. Blowing shoif is not speaking. It's a different type of activity. I don't know, like, I don't know, if you wipe your forehead, that's not called a hefsik. It may not be appropriate to, to do gestures, but it's not a, it's not a interruption. And therefore, I was, I was inclined to say on this basis, that this single man is able to blow shofar, even though he's not up to the gap, be, you know, between one baruch and the next, he should be allowed to blow shofar in the quiet shonasra. Although I'm not totally confident with it, but uh, that that seems to be the the halach. Let's move on to the next question. Oh, so here, as I notice something very interesting, at the end of slichus on a Tanis Sibur, we have this and the same thing we have it at the end of Slichis Yom Kippur by night. But on the, the Slichis up to Rosh Hashanah, we don't have the Rachamona de One. And I was just curious, why is it there and not there? And so now this, this Rosh Hashanah, I, I, I bought myself a uh, a new marzer, which has got various pirushim, and it gave me, it sent me to this, on the Rachamona de Honor, it had a note to this following um, tshuva uh, written by the Benish Chai. It's tshuva's Torah de Shemur. It's got two sforim of tshuva's, at least two. One is called Rav Piolim, and then the other one is called Torah de Shemur. He actually signs his name curiously as Yechezkel Kachali. And apparently, Yechez Kachali somehow is the same gematria as Yosef Chaim. Be that as it may, um, this is the Sefer Torah Lishma. And he deals with the fact that tefillah, generally, we don't daven in Aramaic. And the reason is, says in the Gemara, that one shouldn't daven, a person shouldn't plead for his needs in Aramaic, because the Maloch and the angels will not they will not. They will. They will not process. They will not elevate your tefillah because they don't recognize Aramaic. There's a deeper explanations in this that the Aramaic is like an achirayim for loshen hakodesh. He discusses this at length. They just take one little piece. And so how, how here you say it's okay to daven in Aramaic, and here you say you shouldn't daven in Aramaic. Well, answers like Kash is not a problem. A yochid shouldn't daven in Aramaic. A tzibur can daven because why is that? We have the expression, Hein Kabi Lo Yimos, that Ebrishter will not despise 
the uh, the kabir, the rabbim, tefilos rabbim. So the tefilos rabbim is powerful, and they doesn't need to have the malochim to to elevate it. The Ebrister will accept it, even though it's Aramaic. So that's why we have like Moshe Kaddish, for example, is an Aramaic, and um, this is also discussed here in this tshuva. And now, in the, but just, I want to read this last these last few lines. It says the Ben Ishchai, Now you'll understand that in Slichus has been established a few pakoshes in Aramaic. The Slichus were established to be down in the Betzibur. And to emphasize in the, the Tzibur have got the Koyach, a great, a great power of Kel Kel Kabel Yimos, that they don't need to have the Malochim. Therefore, the Dafka put in, into the Slichus, they put a piece in Aramaic to show, to bolster the, uh, the understanding of, of, uh, of a Tzibur, the Koyach Tzibur, that even Aramaic could also be, can also be elevated. So it's as if there is kind of a sample. There's a, a, a certain little piece of the slichus, the dafka put in Aramaic, to show that the tzibur can manage in Aramaic, they can, tfilos can be accepted in Aramaic. So what I've noticed is that you've got in the slichus, as I said, Yom Kippur, or the Atanas tzibur, you've got Achrachmona de Ona. In the slichus before Rosh Hashanah, we also have a couple of sections in Aramaic. You have the, I've got the bottom of the page, Yemache Omase, and Moron de Vishmayo, these three pieces in Aramaic. And it's according to the Benish Chai, it's the same, it's coming with the same message that we're, we're davening as a tzibur, and it's okay for us to do it in Aramaic, to do part of it in Aramaic, because the Abish will accept it regardless. That's that's what he's saying. Um, so here it's one piece of an Aramaic. Also, I still don't have an answer why this piece was put into these slichas, and that piece was put in those slichas. All right, that's. Uh, you know, perhaps um, by, by sharing it with the Tzibur who are listening now or later, perhaps we'll get an answer on that also. All right, let's move on. Okay, last night, Motze Yom Tov. A Bocha comes over to me and he says, I forgot to say Yalav Yavoy in Rute. So, I, I, continue, I was in the middle of Moedim, and I put in Yalav Yovoi, where we'd say Alanisim. And then I finished, and then continue, I'll, I'll, I'll call these Bokhah Sims, now I say, I finished Moedim, I finished Renestra. So he asks me, was he Yotze or not? So we know that the Mairiv, if you forget Yalav Yov and Mairiv in Rosh Chodesh, you don't have to repeat Renestra, but if you forget Yalav Yov and Mairiv in Chalamoyed, you do have to repeat Renestra. So now he's he remembered to say Yalav Yove, but he put it in the wrong place. Is he Yotsu or not? Now, I actually did not find this addressed in uh, Malaktim. I've got, I mentioned this before, I've got this two volume set of Shiyos Miyovin about all different mistakes which you could make in Davening. And apparently there's, there's more mistakes than he's listed. So we've got a new mistake. So are you Yotsu or not? And um, I told him you're not Yotsu, you have to do it again. So here we have in the Dinam of Rosh Chodesh, where it says, if you didn't say Yalav Yavi where you should, if you realize before Moedim, you put it right there. In other words, you say, Oops, oops, it's not half um, sick. So then you say, and then you say Moedim. You can, in other words, you'll in, insert Yalav Yavi after before Moedim, that would be acceptable because you haven't gone and started the next one. But if you've already started Moedim, so then, if you've already started Moedim, he has to go back to Ritse and, and, and say, insert it in Ritse. If he didn't, then he has to go back to the beginning. So here I have a clear Psach Halacha. If you didn't say Yalav um, in the right place, you have the option of going back to Ritze, but you don't have the option of inserting it at any other spot later. And therefore he missed the opportunity of going back. Therefore he, to the right, to, to, to Ritze, therefore he has to go back to the Venus and Esther. That's what I told him. Again, I, as I said, I didn't see this in any Svarim. I, I looked for it, I didn't find it. Okay. Question. Fellow asks me, this is last week, his neighbor has got a, an apple tree 
and the branches, part of it's from the branches, are overhanging to my garden, he says. Who's, what's about the fruit? Who do they belong to? So here we have, this is a Chush Mishpet, Simon Kuf, Samar Zayin, where you have a tree. If the tree is mamish on the border between two properties, so then the fruit are shared equally. Then there are more ads. If the tree is fully in the field of the one, and it's overhanging to the other one's field, so the, really the fruit of the overhanging tree belong to the owner of the tree. So that's the aloha. The, the, the situation was a little bit more uh, complicated because the neighbor had no way of coming into the questioner's garden. Plus, the neighbor, had, I told him, go and ask the neighbor. Uh, he said, he looks like he's gone away for a couple of weeks. So I said, if that's the case, so then he has been mafkir, as far as he has no interest in those fruit. And, and if you're going to leave them, they're just going to go, go rotten. So I felt in that case, if he's been a mafkir them, uh, and they're going to go to ruin in any case, I felt you could use them, and when he comes back, you'll tell him, uh, and if he wants to be paid for them, you'll pay. Okay, let's move on. This is another question someone asked me this past week. Um, oh, before I go into this one, we had a question. Question nine on your sheet is, may a tenant take schach from the trees growing on his rented premises? So I'm renting a property and I don't own the property. I don't own the trees. The trees are growing and they have schach. Am I allowed to cut the branches of those trees to cover and use them for my sukkah? And uh, I felt that actually, although again, I didn't find this in any, any uh, sources, I felt that you as a tenant actually should be looking after the property. And you should be maintaining the property. So if you're going to cut branches in a way which you're going to ruin the tree, then you're then you're uh, you're wrong in doing so. And that would be a question of Xela also possibly. But if you are cutting the trees in a responsible way, and it's a form of maintaining maintenance, proper maintenance of the property, so then on the contrary, you're doing the responsible thing. And therefore you should be allowed to use the uh for, you use as schach for your sukkah. Which brings me to another question, which I got from some uh, shliach in Eastern Europe. He asked me the question, I'm a little bit hesitant to, to share it, but I'll tell you in any case, and if I got it wrong, so, you know. Um, can he pull off a robbers off a tree in public property? So at first I said, ask, um, ask if you get permissions, no problem. But you know, it's the, the bureaucracy to go and find the official, and this one was sent to this one to that one to find it. So as I said to him, I understood he was short of our robbers. I said to him, you know what? If Reuven will pluck our robbers and Shimon will use them, and Shimon will pluck our robbers and Reuven will use them. Because there is a idea of, um, if, if you're going to say there's an element of gazela here, and therefore it's not good for the, for the mitzvah, all right, so then if it's a gazel and shinu rishus, it's gone to someone else's property, then it takes away the mitzvah of hashava, and you'd be yotze with the... Uh... So really, I was feeling that it's not such a big issue in any case in the first place, because I don't think the authorities would have a problem with you ripping up a couple of uh, leaves off their, their trees. But if there would be a hashash, so you'd be able to uh, address this by switching over one to the other. Let's come to our next question, though. Also, a shliach in somewhere in Eastern Europe, asked me, what is the story if someone is a chiyuv, is in his year of Avel HaShachman Litzlan, and he's running late. The Tzibur are holding now by Oleinu, it's the last Kaddish, and he is in the middle of saying Pesukah de Zimra. So is a chiyuv, uh, to say Kaddish, is he allowed to interrupt the middle of Pesukah de Zimra to say Kaddish? That is the question. So what we have in front of you is from the Piskei Tshuvas, where he quotes the Chido in the Sefer Kesha Goidel, 
who says that you are allowed to say, um, he is talking about the Kaddish from before, how you do? And then he says, Yosun, within the 11 months of Avelos of our father and mother, and he came late, as now he's middle of Sukkot de Zimra. See, he is allowed to say the Kadeshim uh, um, at the end of the davening, if he knows that he won't have an opportunity later to say those Kadeshim. Even if there are others who are saying Kadesh, but he is allowed to address his Chiyu. He's allowed to interrupt. And the general idea of answering various things in, in, in Sukhita Zimra and Krishna, Vichas Krishna, is based upon the idea of Mepnei Hayyura, Mepnei HaKovid, which we all know the Mishnah in, uh, in Brochus, that you are allowed to interrupt, to respond, Mepnei Hayyura, Mepnei HaKovid. And so here he has a Chiyuv, and he's allowed to address that Chiyuv uh, by, in the middle of Sukhita Zimra. I'm not talking about Vichas Krishna, but Sukhita Zimra is more lenient. So he is allowed to. That's what the Poskim say. So now, obviously, it will come to mind there's a letter of the Rebbe about this. And that is in Chelik Zayn of Igris. It's also in Shulchan Nachum, a well-known letter. The letter is addressed to the late Rebbe Yitzchak Dubov, who was, he lived in Manchester, and he was a mashgiach in Manchester Yeshiva. Rebbe Segal, Rebbe Rosef was the Rosh Hashiva, and Rabbi Dubov was a mashkiach, and on the quiet, he was makar of many Eden, Lantanya, many, many Eden became chassidim, and chabad chassidim, through his influence. Meanwhile, as the mashkiach, he wrote to the, he asked the Rebbe, there's a letter of the Fredeke Rebbe printed in, in Sefer HaMamorim Tov Shintes, where the, Re, the Re, Fredeke Rebbe wrote, talks very strongly about the Kaddish Drabonon before Hoidu. It looks like there was, it was being neglected and he promotes the importance of saying the Kaddish before Hoidu. Okay. Now, the Bitzrak Dubov davened Barichas, he davened slowly. The Bochrim's minion was probably faster than him. So he had the following question. He would start davening earlier than the minion and when the minion was, let's say, started 10 minutes earlier. And so then when the minion came up to the, um, you know, Rabbi Shmuel with the Kaddish, he was already after Bar Shomar. And he was, he was asking whether he was, should, whether he's allowed to say the Kaddish, the Rabbonon, before Hoidu, when he is already ahead of the minion in Pesukha de Zimra. To which the Rebbe answers, Hine Ladaiti, I think from Tov Shinyud Gimel, in my opinion, I don't have the time to, to research this, but it's also, I think it's, it's simple. That the saying of the Kaddish Drabon is not your personal duty. It's a mutalala minion. It's the minion, someone of the minion should be making the saying of the Kaddish. But it's not a personal chiyav. Therefore, you shouldn't be interrupting your Pesukit Zimra to say the Kaddish because it's not a personal chiyah. Which from this itself, I see that's not a contradiction at all. Because there he's talking about volunteering to say Kaddish Rabbon, which could be said by anyone. Here, our question is about a Kaddish, which for a, a Yosem in Chumad is a chiyah to say Kaddish. So then it is his chiyah. And therefore, it's two different, different stories. If it's a chiyah, a personal chiyah to say Kaddish, and he's in the middle of Sukkot Zimri, he could, if it's just to cover a, a communal need, then it shouldn't be him, it should be done by someone else. Okay. Um, again, someone asked me, it's a bit late to talk about it now, but it, it was before Sukkot, what's the story about a child under Bar Mitzvah? What do you do about Arba Minim? So, of course, the ideal would be to buy them uh, their own set, but if for whatever reason, that's not, a, not a, a, available. So let's take a look in the Loshen of the Shechon Aruch. This is in, in uh, Tafresh Nun Ches. It says, Lo yitnenu b'yoyim rishon lekoton koidem shiyetzi b'ay. Don't give the esri, lulu, the same thing, to a child before you have done the mitzvah. B'nei shakoton koin evene makne. Because the cotton will acquire, he won't be able to release it back to you. Minat toire. B'nimso. So he gives it back to you, it's not given back to you. 
So you, if you give a child uh, your arba minim on the uh, on the first day, it should be lochem. So it has to be yours, you know. So you, we can't get it. You, he can't give it back to you. You can't fulfill the mitzvah after the child has used it. Some say when the child is of a certain age, uh, it could be about seven or eight or something, where they have a little bit more of an understanding of, of buying and selling. Some say that is acceptable. Then he adds, the imtoifus imatinoik, yodo If you give the child the lulu venestri, but you hold on to it also, you don't release it. You put it in the child's hand, but you also are holding it. Then that's okay. okay. Then the child hasn't been koine. Kinyan means a show of ownership. And on the contrary, if you are holding on to it, you haven't released it. So you're not giving them the ownership. All right. So that's a, that's what it's just in the Machaba writes in the Shukhanar. So now we have the Mishtabura Sifkotan Chabchez. He says like this. All right. So by the fact that you hold on to it, that the child isn't koine. Therefore, you're you're okay. Then you add the fifth line, El de Bechol Eilu. For eights, the fact that you hold on to the Esri and the Lulu, you have covered that you have retained ownership. But the child has not been Yotze because he's not, it's not Shiloi, he's not called Lochem. And so the father also hasn't done the mitzvah of Chinuch to give the child the Esri and Lulu, which is his own. So you, you've, you've saved your, 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 your own interest or for, or for, for other adults, but meanwhile, you've deprived the child and deprived, of the mitzvah on the first day, and you've deprived yourself of mitzvah of chinuch. Then he adds, The mitzvah is chinuch miskai and gambasho. Others say no. Chinuch can be fulfilled even if the child doesn't own the asterisk. I know when he's an adult, he'll have to own the asterisk, but you can be, and on the level of chinuch, it can be with a borrowed asterisk. Because even with a borrowed asterisk, you're also training the child to do the mitzvah. I must say that I'm sure, uh, you know, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, where there's such a shortage of, of Arab minim, I'm sure this is what they were doing. That they, would, they, would, they wouldn't release it to the child, and they would rely on these, these, on these opinions. So as I said, of course, the better uh, option would be to... Uh, to have a separate set for the children, which is Baruch Hashem now broadly, widely available. But if that, if not, you hold on to it with the child, and uh, and you don't release it, and you you the with, 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 with that way. You see that we try to hold that way. All right. Finally, last week we, or last two weeks ago, we had the discussion about the Hayyim Tam Tzenu, and I was worried about the sequence of the Aleph base Tam Tzenu to Varchenu to Gadlenu. The Dershenu, and then it says Tishma Shavoseinu, then Tekabel Barachimim, and then Tismachenu. So it's Shein Kuf Top. And I was concerned about the sequence there. So I've mentioned numerous times, Rumea Zirkin, he wrote to me a very simple thing. The Hayom Tishma, Hayom Tekabel. First day, you ask the Ebrishta to hear our, our prayer, our cry, and then you say, You heard it. Heard it then you should accept it. You can't say Hayom Tukabo and then Hayom Tishma. It doesn't make sense. But you, can't, you can't accept it before you've heard it, so to speak. So it's just on, the, on a very simplistic level, that's why Tishma comes before Tukabo. I'm still not totally happy because you can find other uh, uh, and, and words in the Aleph base to have the Sheen after the Kuf. But on the, on the level of Shat, I think it's quite a good answer. Okay, I'm going to stop with this and... Um, after Shabbos Bereshis, we're going to go back to Motzah Shabbos with Hashem, um, and we'll we'll do it at eight thirty. And if we uh, later on, we'll bring it a little bit earlier. That people ask it to be earlier. But meanwhile, this is this is I think manageable. I think Shabbos goes out uh, about an hour earlier, so we should be able to manage it. And uh, if you if you if you're listening to this year whilst you're helping to to, as Rabbi Luke calls it, television and television. So, so be it. Okay. Zayit ha'le gesund, a guten moed, and a good Shabbos, a guten yom tov, and we should be meeting good health. Kaltov.